Today in Paris, the centenary of world cinema was celebrated. On the 28th of December 1895, on the Boulevard des Capuchines, Lumiere brothers showed their first films, The Arrival of the Train, Baby's Dinner, and The Gardener Watered. Meanwhile, the Arab World Institute in Paris was celebrating the centenary of the Egyptian cinema, but neither the organizers of the show nor the Parisian audience had any idea that the creators of the first Egyptian cartoons were originally from Belarus. In Russia, the beginning of the 20th century was bloody. A humiliating defeat in the Russian-Japanese war, inter-religious unrest and revolutionary agitation. Armed groups increasingly used rifles and explosives. Riots took place in Russian towns and villages. Pogroms are violent mass actions against any group of people based on religious, ethnic and racial grounds instigated as a rule by extremist organizations or the police, often accompanied by the destruction and looting of property, rape, torture, and killings. Pogrom is a Russian word, but in the course of time it has become an international one, as well as satellite or vodka. Pogrom is in all languages. Pogrom. Rechitsa is a town in southern Belarus. At the beginning of the century, there was a large Jewish community. Jews were known to be craftsmen, carpenters, tailors, and shoemakers. Carpenters decorated the windows of Rechitsa houses with carved frames. These things seemed to be useless, but they looked nice. In 1905, Pogram struck Rechitsa. Everything started with the breaking of window glass in the houses. Then the holes in the windows were stuffed with pillows. But in small towns such as Rosita, glass used to be replaced quickly. There was a reason for that. The community were very good friends, regardless of whether they were Russians or Belarusians. If for some reason a neighbor had to follow the demands of the Black Hundreds, the union of Archangel Michael, he tried not to offend his neighbors. When there were programs, he ran ahead and apologized, saying that he would break windows. Then he put the glass back. He eventually broke a window and the hundreds went on. Next day he came back to the neighbors and replaced the windows. There were bloody clashes which sometimes ended in murder. There were also cruel pogroms. People were killed. Grandmother's sister, for example, hid under the stove, covered with a quilt. And through this quilt, she was murdered with a pitchfork. The Tsar, Nicholas II, concerned with the growing blood and violence in the country, in February 1905, issued the following diktat. Turmoil and unrest in capitals and in many areas of our empire fill our hearts with sorrow. The good of the Russian Tsar is closely connected with the good of the Russian people and the sadness of the people in its grief. Disturbances can cause chaos in our society and threatens the integrity and uniqueness of our empire. The diktat was supposed to put an end to the turmoil and unrest but the reaction of the Russian people was directly opposite. On the 17th of October, 1905, on the day of the publication of the diktat, riots broke out in 660 villages, and the consequences were terrible. Rostov, 150 people were killed. Odessa, 800 people were killed, and several thousand people were injured. About 1,600 houses were destroyed. The exodus of the Jews from Russia began. Amongst those who left their homeland in 1905 were the Frankel family from Rechitsa. The head of the family, Betzal, was a bookseller, and moreover, he was fond of photography. A photo which he took at the beginning of the century has been preserved, and on the reverse, the following words were written in Russian. The amateur snapshot, B. Frankel Gommel. Below there was a stamp and the inscription by hand in Yiddish stated, this photo was taken by my son Betzel, who mastered the art of photo developing. 
In September 1905, Betzal left Rashidza with his wife Nisa and son Herschel. They went to the south to Odessa and from there by steamboat to Palestine. I think that they left Rochitsa in a hurry. It happened in September 1905. I found their arrival documents for Palestine. That certificate confirmed that Betzor Frankel arrived from Rochitsa, the town in Minsk province, to Palestine in 1905. They stayed in Jaffa, which was under the protectorate of Turkey, as well as the rest of Palestine. Betzal opened a bookshop there. As they were in the Promised Land, he hoped that they were not in danger. By 1914, they had six children, three girls and three boys. But then the war began, and the threat of pogroms hung over the Frankos again. Turkey initiated the war against Russia. In the Frankos documents, it was written that they were refugees from Russia. This record turned out to be fatal. As Russian people were considered to be potential spies, they were expelled from Jaffa, Tel Aviv, and other cities on the 27th of November, 1914. The Frankos were on the blacklist. They fled, this time to Alexandria, Egypt. 1914 was a difficult year for Russia. The front divided the Belarusian lands into two. The civilians were hastily evacuated from the front line, being only given 24 hours. Special camps for refugees were organized. The numbers of refugees was appalling. According to various estimates, there were between one and three million people. In Egypt, Betzal also opened a bookshop, but it was clear that it was not enough to have such a business in order to feed a large family. The eldest son, Herschel, was fond of the American cinema. His idol was Charlie Chaplin. The fate of his heroes was very similar to one of their family. Herschel even wrote a letter to Chaplin asking to take him to his acting troupe. David, the second son of Betzal, was a talented draftsman. His drawings and cartoons were often printed in the Egyptian newspapers. The third son, Solomon, had golden hair. Being very smart, he showed his ability in engineering, mechanics, and electrical work. There were hardly anything that he could not fix, from a stove to a tractor. Anyhow, his sons could earn a living but the family lived in poverty. In Alexandria, David was very lucky to meet Professor Stolov, a famous teacher of drawings and paintings, who taught the technique of Chinese lacquer painting. In the 30s, the style Art Deco was extremely popular. It also perfectly combined with the art of the East. Thus, a Jewish family from Belarus successfully mastered techniques of Chinese painting in Egypt. Such a mixture of cultures appeared to be extremely fruitful. Brothers Frankel began to paint furniture and very quickly became very popular in Alexandria and then in Cairo. The height of their success was the gold medal of Agricultural and Industrial Exhibition of Egypt in 1936. The highest award of the main exhibition of the country attracted the attention of very influential people. Senior officials lined up for the elite furniture, which wore the branded inscription, Frankel, Cairo. After all, the king of Egypt, Farouk, ordered the Frankel's furniture. Farouk I, king of Egypt, born in 1920, came to the throne in 1937 at the age of 17, the representative of the dynasty of Muhammad Ali. Farouk's wife, Queen Farida, got a divorce and was removed from the throne in November 1948. Due to the fact, having brought into the world three daughters, she was unable to give birth to an heir. Then, King Farouk married Nariman, an ordinary 16-year-old girl. Prince Ahmed Fahd was born from this marriage. The defeat of Egypt in the war with Israel in 1949 and the tension in relations with Great Britain led to the fact that in July 1952, King Farouk abdicated. So Betzel met with the King of Egypt. The income of the family business was enough for a comfortable life, and it would be nice. But the brothers Frankel were obsessed with one passion, cinema, and it's known that every passion is addictive. 
Once after a long dispute at the family council, it was decided to invest all the money earned for the sale of furniture into the creation of an animation studio. This room looks like half a century ago. It's still not repaired. Everything is as it was during their lives. When I was a kid, we were also forbidden to enter here. It is full of drawings, photographs, letters, clippings from newspaper. It contains the whole history of the Brothers Frankel. The problem was that the Brothers Frankel did not know anything about the production of cartoons, and there was nowhere to learn that. The technical process was kept in secret. Therefore, they were compelled to invent all the equipment themselves, working by trial and error. In addition, they had no idea that a 10-minute film needs around about 15,000 drawings, frame by frame, with all the individual movements of the characters. The characters were invented by David. Solomon was engaged in technical issues, shooting, film development, and sound. He designed and built all original equipment for movie making and watching. The premiere was on the 8th of February 1936 in the Cinema Cosmography in downtown Cairo. Mishmish Effendi, the main character of the cartoon, was very eccentric, carefree, cheerful and mischievous. On the day of the premiere, the brothers Frankel were too excited. How would the audience react to their movie? Herschel was sent to check out the audience reaction, but he was so frightened that he daren't even enter the hall. The brothers were standing outside at the door of the cinema, and suddenly they heard laughter, then real loud applause. It was a triumph. At that very time, Solomon met Marseille. One day, they invited me to their house. In the room, they had set the projector to show the cartoons. I remember that Solomon said, I always looked at you and not at the screen. After that, we met frequently. Solomon thought he struck my heart with his cartoons. But to tell the truth, I didn't like their first movies. <laughs> the cartoon character, Mishmish Effendi, quickly became extremely popular throughout Egypt. The studio, Frankel Pictures Productions, received unprecedented orders. Ministry of Agriculture offered to make Mishmish Effendi the hero of a special educational film, which was to encourage the farmers against parasites in the cotton fields of Egypt, as cotton was the main wealth creator of the country. The effect of the film was incredible. Not only did all the parasites disappear from the fields, but also the weeds. In 1939, World War II started. Egypt severed diplomatic relations with Germany. The Minister of War commissioned the Brothers Frankel to create a movie in support of a state military loan. Mishmish Effendi created a surge of patriotic feelings amongst Egyptians and helped to raise funds for the modernization of the army. The film was called National Defense. Thanks to his resourcefulness and optimism, brave Mishmish led Egypt to the victory over the enemy. He invented new weapons which were capable of destroying any equipment of the enemy with one click. The popularity of the cartoons created by the brothers Frankel and the recognition that was expressed by the government of Egypt and indeed the king himself seemed to protect the Frankels from trouble. But in 1948, everything changed. The defeat of Egypt in the war against Palestine intensified nationalistic feelings in the country. The revolution was coming and the fear of pogroms again hung over the Frankels. Many Jews lost their jobs. The Egyptians took away their large stores. Companies were confiscated. And the people lost everything. In 1949, thousands of Jews began to leave for Egypt and go to France, England, America and Israel. 
en merde un bel appartement. We had to sell everything very cheap. De les vendre comme ça pour rien. Moi, je pouvais pas. I could not cry. I could not speak. J'avais la gorge nouée. C'était horrible. My throat was choked. It was awful. Parti, c'était un déchirement. They moved to France and settled in the suburbs of Paris, Montgeron. Now Didier, Betzel's grandson, lives here. When we were kids, this door was taboo for us, and although we were not told directly about that, we knew that it was strictly forbidden to open it. So we all thought the treasures were hidden there. Today I can easily open this door as all the house is mine. Really valuable things that are left over from my grandfather are preserved here. This is his mug, only my grandfather could drink tea from it. He drank tea in the Russian manner, biting off pieces of sugar. And this is my grandfather's candlestick. Every Saturday evening he lit the candles. I think that this candlestick is also from Rijitsa. All these simple things had great value for them. In France, the brothers also decided to create a cartoon studio, but it was much more difficult to build and attract attention there. As France was known to be the birthplace of the cinema, so things did not go well. Their last work was a film dedicated to the centennial of the waltz of Johann Strauss's Blue Danube. Unfortunately, the customers didn't have enough money to see the work. Betzel died in 1963. He was buried in a public grave. He didn't become rich. Money, which they earned in Egypt, was all used to arrange their life in France. Yet it's possible to say that he was very lucky. He died a natural death. He was not killed during the Jewish pogroms in 1905. He was not killed in one of the fronts of World War II, shot during Stalin's repressions, burned in the gas chambers at Auschwitz, or crushed in the ghetto. I remember every Friday he was involved in the family's financial calculations. He put all coins into columns. The coins were yellow and white. He led the accounting for the family. Looking at these coins, I was sure that we had plenty of money, that we were rich. But these were not valuable coins. Betzel often thought of Belarus and Rechitsa. He read the Soviet press. He wanted to come back, but they could not do it. When my parents were born, they were registered according to their father's nationality, my grandfather's, who was identified as a refugee from Russia. And in such a way, it was written that the children were also refugees from Russia. I was born in France much later. And although I've never been to Russia, according to my documents, I was a refugee from Russia too. When I needed to obtain a passport for travel abroad, I was again registered as a refugee from Russia. I had the right to travel to all countries except Russia. And of course, I really wanted to go there, but it was forbidden. Didier was consumed by the idea of returning to Belarus, not to Russia. He tried to banish it, but it returned again and again. The contact with Rechitsa was lost. Didier did not know what remained of the town after a devastating war. But once I looked at the map and saw Gomel, Rechitsa, I remember the letters in our house with a postmark on the envelope, Gomel, so it meant that it existed. At the same time, I told myself, no, it's too far, it was so long ago, I'm not going to go there. One day, however, I said to myself, come on, it's time to be through with it, stop torturing yourself. And suddenly, a week later, I had bought a plane ticket to Minsk. Previously, I was determined not to go there, but now I had the plane ticket, and then I found myself in the car, and finally saw the signpost, Rechitsa. It was an intense feeling, an explosion of emotions. Didier was struck by the old houses, windows with frames, 
about the streets which were very well preserved. He imagined as a child his grandfather running there. He'd only been there for three days, and on one of these days, Didier was invited to the village Homichi, close to Rechitsa, to attend a dedication ceremony for a monument to the villagers who died at the hands of Nazis at the beginning of the war. Last Friday, at the mass grave in the village of Homichi, a memorial service was held. Jews shot in August 1941 were buried there. In August 1941, more than 50 Jewish people were executed men, women, elderly people and children. 17 families lost their lives there. More than 50 people, including small children, even babies. That was horrible. On that very day, after lunch at the Rechitsa Museum, the guide told me about the history of the city, about the people and life in Rechitsa a hundred years ago. It was extremely interesting. I showed the postcard which I had taken by accident on leaving the house. There was something written in Russian. The guide took them and began to read. I suddenly noticed that her eyes had widened. She asked for silence and then translated the text on the back of the postcards. It was sent to my grandfather by his brother, who remained in Russia. The posting date was 1946. He wrote that the war was over, that he was the only one of the family who was lucky to survive. And then it was written, you know, Raya, Raika, my sister, was shot together with four children in Homichi. I immediately thought of a witness who told me that morning about a woman who was shot with four children. The same story was described in the card. This woman was real. She lived here and died. I was so shocked. My eyes filled with tears and I could hardly restrain myself from crying. I felt she was at that moment above me in the sky. In 1995, the year of the centennial of the cinema, Didier accidentally discovered old boxes with films in the attic of his house. He looked at the pictures and realized that he held in his hands the originals of the first Egyptian cartoons. Didier phoned the cinema department of the Arab World Institute. The woman at the other end politely but emphatically replied, young man, cartoons appeared in Egypt in the early 60s. Then by fax, Didier sent them the original poster of that time. Half an hour later, people from the Arab World Institute were at his home. They were all shocked. In a short period of time, the film was restored and it was decided to show the cartoon of the Brothers Frankel to the public. And not just to show, but to start the evening and celebrations dedicated to the centenary of the Egyptian cinema. My mother and father were also invited to the presentation. My father was 85. I remember seeing his emotions during the film. That moment was really exciting. My father seemed to return to his younger years when he was a budding inventor. Sometimes he criticized his work. He muttered, this picture is dark, sounds bad, but this episode is nice. And I personally discovered this cartoon for the first time. I remember the first episode, Eternal Egypt, the pyramids, the Nile, palm trees, good graphics depicting the true feelings of Egypt. Our house always had an Egyptian feel. We often talked about this ancient country, and so I saw it on the screen. Yes, their life was full of drama. I think that faith helped them, deep faith. 
And yet, they were very optimistic. Even in times of awful disaster, cursing the fates, they helped each other. The Arabs have a concept, maktub. It refers to a predetermined course of events. All your life is recorded in advance. All events, incidents, meetings and partings. Everything that should happen is written and predetermined. And by whom is it written? God, I think. And would you like to change your destiny? Yes, I'd like to, but I can't. <laughs> There were many refugees from Belarus in the 20th century. They refer to different numbers, two million, three million, and even four million. That century was too cruel and intolerable. But one thing is certain. Everyone who had to leave home was hoping to come back one day.